Hi, Rudolf. Welcome to the Future Proof Operations Podcast. Hi, Ben. Great to have you on the show. Rudolf, before we start, could you give me a 60 seconds overview of who you are and what you are doing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe even shorter than 60 seconds, but, mm -hmm. but let's make it brief. I'm originally from Czech Republic. I studied at the University of Chemistry and Technology Prague. And uh, first it was a synthesis production of pharmaceuticals and then followed up by a technology of organic compounds that I finally got my PhD from. And uh, yeah, uh, at the university uh, for 10 years, I'd been working at the process design lab. Uh, and that was a, yeah, a amazing opportunity to learn from a wealth of experiences gradually gained, I would say for more than 60 years by implementing processes from lab uh, to full scale all around the world. And in that sense, it was a pure luck, so to say. And then after that, uh, I've become uh, a CTO uh, for one of the large chemical plants in Czech. Uh, and after three successful, I would say, years, uh, I realized that I want to change the chemistry I'm doing and a little bit enhance my process design experiences, so to say. And uh, I also want to change, uh, or now nah, I want to, I wanted to explore a larger company's environment abroad. So that brought me finally to Sweden last year. And now you are working as a demo, pl demo plant manager, right? Yep. And if exactly. we talk about that plant, give us a little bit more context. So how, how big is it? How many people are working there? Uh, the plant is such, uh, the pilot plant is inside uh, the production facility, mm -hmm. which, uh, consists of, uh, about 300 people. And, uh, there are three, so to say other units, uh, production units, uh, focused on something different. And uh, it's a uh, part of the integrated supply chain. So, uh, yeah, hard to explain the size. Uh, and but yeah, but three like people that. it explains it already um, uh, enough. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for your introduction. Today we want to talk about the state of the chemical industry on the one hand side, you, because you are an expert for that, and we will talk about the dark factory if that really exists. Yeah, we had that in the preparation call already. And I'm looking forward to that. Um, okay. Where we talked about a factory where, where probably nobody is working in in future. Um, to set the context a little bit better, when we talk about the chemical industry, I'm not an expert of it. Could you explain uh, or describe the current state of the chemical industry? Yes. So let's uh, let's take it from a little bit of history, let's say in in, in a broader context. Mm -hmm. Uh, the chemical industry has been growing uh, over 100 years and uh, eventually you might be surprised, but uh, most of the chemistry behind, as well as the processes concept, has been known already for 50 to 80 years. And uh, it's kind of a tied up network, uh, which arrangement follows certain logic. And uh, it was developed in reaction or as a result of uh, availability of raw materials know-how and also the economic strength. So in, I think that in 20th century, uh, share of chemical industry on overall country economics was considered as a, you know, one of the key criteria to compare. And, uh, yeah, the, the, the chemical industry is practically a supply chain that starts, uh, of, uh by processing, uh, raw materials, then through production of bulk chemicals, so to say, to finally so-called chemical specialties. Mm -hmm. And in the end, uh, yeah, all chemical industry product end up directly or indirectly in the form of essential products for everyday life, right? So, uh, yeah, pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, fuels, fibers, whatever, but also, for example, food, right? Because uh, this is not a product of chemical industry, but you're using uh, fertilizers, pesticides, antibiotics to produce that. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that, uh, without those, I find quite hard to imagine any kind of sustainable living at current demand demand. Yeah. In the preparation call, we already talked a little bit about the challenges in the industry and how innovation can be done. And what I found super interesting is that you said most of the stuff is already invented. So if you try to in bring innovation into chemical industry or you want to find something new, there is already a lot of stuff in place and it's very hard to innovate. Could you describe that a little bit more? Yeah. So again, a little bit of history. <laughs> uh, 
I would say that uh, in the beginning, the approach was uh, rather uh, empirical, so to say. So uh, apart from many other chemicals, for instance, benzene mm-hmm. has been produced as a pure chemical at large scale. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, thousand tons for further synthesis, even before somebody directly confirmed the unique arrangement of the aromatic ring, for example. And this is one of the illustrative examples uh, of the fact that in many cases, uh, uh, people produce pure chemicals at this scale already, even when some key fundamentals were in the state of hypothesis. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, the most of the chemical industry has been, you're right, uh, already developed, uh, and, uh, and finding new chemical roads to produce chemicals that, uh, have been already on the market has yeah. uh, become more and more challenging, yeah. let's say. So when you start exploring new ways, there is, I would say, more than 90% chance that somebody has done that already decades ago. Yeah, crazy. And this brings us already a little bit closer to what you are doing on a daily basis, because um, when we talk about innovation, what does that mean now for the chemical industry? If you want to be innovative currently, how do you do that? I think that the uh, yeah um, the, the the development of the new processes uh, has become difficult. That of course uh, correct, but it's not impossible. Uh, I remember one uh, uh, one licensor for production of uh, fatty acid metal esters, for example, that uh, came quite recently with completely different process uh, in comparison to conventional one. At the same time, I also remember. And in Germany, uh, there was introduced like 10 years ago, a completely different kind of philosophy approach to cyclopentanon, uh, using, yeah, uh, cyclopentene and nitrous oxide instead of conventional oxidation and dihydrogenation, uh, afterwards. So, uh, yeah, it's not impossible. It's hard, but I think that, uh, the effort, uh, in chemical industry, yeah. You can observe that uh, there is a bit of a shift in effort to change the focus from fossil resources to, for example, renewable materials. And that, of course, would require new processes uh, and uh, or at least some add-ons to existing ones. Mm-hmm. But this uh, attempt uh, is not straightforward, and that's given logically by chemical structure of those materials because uh, you're working with uh, complicated non-standard mixtures and that always brings uh, energetic demands. So I think that unless it's heavily subsidized, uh, at the current situation, uh, those roads can yeah, hardly compete with natural gas and crude oil. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, that realistically would stay like this for decades. Yeah. Okay. Because everything is about economics. Yeah. Sticking with that picture that a lot of stuff is already invented, but on the other hand side, the industry still wants innovation and wants to optimize processes. You are now coming in and you say, okay, there is a concept which is being used already for some years, probably. You should explain it then, which is called chemical engineering. And this is something different compared to the innovations probably 100 years ago. And you are working on that. So you are working on that chemical engineering approach. Um, explain us, what is it and why is it so important right now? I think that you may be, uh, we may be thinking eventually about process design, mm-hmm. uh, which is a, a not a different discipline, uh, but uh, I would say it's a different mindset because that mindset integrates chemistry and the chemical engineering and also economics together. Yeah. And, okay. uh, when you, when you do the process design, uh, you are converging to your final layout using, uh, I would call it synthetic approach or synthetic work, combining all those aspects. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, it, it's a difference like, uh, architect versus constructor. So when you do the process design, it's, it's kind of a research then, uh, that is driven by economics. So you start, for example, uh, with a literature survey and uh, gather some information about reactions and, and uh, prices of chemicals and, uh, and their physical chemical properties. And uh, uh, even before you start to do any kind of laboratory experiments, you already have to draw um, some layouts and basic ideas how the process should look like. And, uh, and you already have certain idea about OPEX and CAPEX. 
Mm-hmm. And, and then uh, everything you do in the lab, you basically uh, follow the strategy that uh, you already foresee make economical sense. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the research is restrictive. Uh, and that's, uh, for example, the difference, the main difference between this type of research and uh, scientific research, because you cannot do such a restriction in, uh, in, uh, in science yeah. because, uh, to application aspect, because that, uh, that wouldn't work that, that, that good. When we talked about that process design approach in our preparation call, you said that there are more variables, which you put in, and you talked about the chemistry part, the technology part and the economics part, right? And this is the big difference mm-hmm. compared to 100 years ago. I think that uh, uh, this is uh, very much still similar. Uh, uh, the, the thing is that maybe nowadays uh, we are using a little bit different tools. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. And uh, so I, I, I think that, uh, of course, uh, a lot of equipment nowadays you just uh, maybe simulate like uh, or design based on laboratory data that may be heat exchanger, rectification column or whatever. But then uh, the, uh, you always have a chemical reactor and that's something you, uh, you have to upscale still. And in that, at that, that point, you're using rather empi- empirical approach than uh, some kind of mathematical modeling based on lab data. And which tools do you use now, which you couldn't use 100 years ago? So when it comes to digitalization and software, um, is AI a big data, a big topic now? So explain us a little bit how that works today and how you, you go through that process. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the AI plays a role, I think, or at, at least I see that it is starting, uh, started to play a role. The, the thing is that, uh, initially, uh, any kind of simulation software was, uh, created or designed in order to uh, design the equipment like heat exchanger or column. But those softwares uh, have grown into something fairly bigger that, uh, yeah, recently started to be connected, for example, to your uh, own uh, online plant data. Yeah. And, and you have a chemical plant and connected to this software. It's, of course, uh, in unbelievably demanding in terms of uh, memory and, those, and uh, operation capacity and those kind of things. But uh, the AI can already somewhat uh, find the relations uh, among variables you might want to optimize or maybe even overlook. But uh, yeah, uh, I'm quite uh, conservative in uh, uh, when it comes to this approach because I, I think that uh, this should be in the hand of engineers. And at the same time, I, I'm quite sure that uh, you have to be exceptional engineer to know how to interpret data from sophisticated software like this anyways. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but this is something uh, uh, that wasn't definitely there 50, 80 years ago, but still it, at the same time, it doesn't mean that if you take this software and, and, uh, and start to use it, uh, in existing plant that is uh, being operating for 60, 70 years, you can optimize it by 50%. That's yes. definitely not true. So there has been already a lot of very exceptional work done that times using just pencil and, and, and paper. Mm-hmm. Rudolf, let's try to make it now a little bit concrete or a little bit more concrete to take a step into your pilot plan. Because when we talk about tools and digitalization about AI, I could assume that you could do your work just from home and you have a computer and you just simulate everything. But this is obviously not the case. So how is your uh, demo plant or your pilot plant now contributing to do that procedures to to bring that optimizations to real life? How is that working? Yeah, it, it's a little bit back and forth because you have to feed your software with something mm-hmm. uh, and, and then maybe calculate something and, and then go back and remeasure something again. Uh, that's... Uh, yeah, uh, I would say uh, that the simulation software can do uh, enormous amount of iterations that you you would never do uh, using your calculator and your pen. 
that that's uh, too much work. And at the same time, uh, the simulation software provides you with the opportunity to, let's say, draw certain ideas or uh, um, concepts and, and quickly check how that works in terms of mass and heat balance mm-hmm. without uh, yeah being uh, locked in your office for five days in a row and, and calculating everything. That can be done in half an hour, for example. Yeah. And then you have a, a pilot plant, let's say, where, of course, like I mentioned, um, you cannot go from lab scale, even with the best simulation ever, to the full scale directly. And uh, so when it comes to any kind of system, including reaction, then you you then it comes to any kind of pilot plant, which is sort of... Uh, intermediate step uh, or a part of scaling up or, uh, towards your goal because uh, yeah um, investors are working with a proof of concept approach that that's for one and that's understandable and uh, and also there are a couple of uh, things that you cannot foresee and model mm-hmm. uh, based on lab data and that's for for example a lot of operational learning like you can have a full following uh, that helps you uh, when you observe that on a larger scale. It helps you design uh, even larger equipment or corrosion, for example. Mm-hmm. That's uh, super difficult to uh, to predict. <laughs> so, yeah, that that that's uh, why I see the, the role in of pilot plants that can be already a little bit diminished uh, nowadays yeah. uh, when comparing to 100 years ago. But uh, it still has a role. Yeah. Okay. Since we are talking about the plant now, the shop floor, oftentimes I talk about uh, the factory and how it's looking like, how many people are working there and how the role of the people which are working there will evolve in the next years. And we had that already in the preparation call. And then we talked about uh, dark factories, so a factory where probably nobody is in and everything is being automized. And you said, hey, this is already reality or at least close to reality for the chemical industry. And I would like to touch that for some minutes. So um, explain us a little bit more. Is it already happening or is it a vision? How is the factory looking like? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's happening. And uh, the, um, most of the processes are fully automized. automized. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, first of all, uh, in terms of capacity, most of the chemical industry is running in a continuous integrated regime mm-hmm. where everything is flowing 24 seven and you're doing uh, turnarounds or pit stop, whatever, yeah, every second year or every year or whatever. But uh, in principle, those processes are running 24 seven. And, uh, so, so this automation and automatization and, uh, uh, yeah, it brings you certain freedom, right? And, uh, you can operate maybe with less people. Uh, nowadays, uh, you can uh, control the process practically via your smartphone. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I, as an example, uh, I I know one site that is uh, operating twenty four seven, but uh, only morning shift is meant, and uh, the, it's uh, supervised overnight from from uh, uh, yeah completely remotely and uh, actually from a completely different country. Yeah, crazy. So uh, th- th- that's that's possible and. Uh, and uh, it's not only about uh, saving money for salaries, but uh, which is, of course uh, is there, but uh, it's also the safety aspect. Mm-hmm. But you will still need somebody who is maintaining that machinery park. So how do you do it then? Yeah, you uh, you have very robust uh, failure scenarios. Mm-hmm. So and 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 based on that, you have people on call, for example, or or uh, you. At, at critical position, you uh, you double your equipment. Mm-hmm. So if something is malfunctioning, you can just simply switch into into another. And uh, yeah, th- th- those principles or safety measures has been there for decades also. Okay. We are coming step by step to the end of the podcast, but there's one topic which we definitely want to touch and it's sustainability. At the beginning of the episode, you already talked about gas and crude oil and you said it's uh, still an essential part of the chemical processes and i would like to understand how you see the role of the chemical industry when it comes to sustainability how what is the impact currently already and how do you plan the next years 
uh, that this impact will grow and we will have the chemical industry as one very important part who is paying into getting better in sustainability aspects. Yeah, uh, the the one thing is, uh, well, let's say, the, the chemical industry as such has been always pushed uh, towards uh, reducing uh, any kind of footprint. And that, that was done by market and uh, especially uh, when uh, India and China uh, have become a world player in this, that was 20, 30 years ago. So that uh, completely uh, reshaped uh, the status of a chemical industry. I think that, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, the, most of the chemical industry is, is uh, integrated, continuous system. And also nowadays it's, uh, and that already uh, means that uh, you're integrating towards uh, lowest possible consumption of raw materials and heat. Mm -hmm. And that's all part of also certain sustainability, so to say. Uh, in, of course, in contrast to early days, uh, I think that the chemical industry uh, last decades has made a significant step forward, for example, in terms of any kind of pollution. And uh, also in the regions, you might have doubts about, uh, but of course it's at the expense of energy, but uh, nowadays it's more like the end product that uh, behaves like pollutants, like plastics or so, than any kind of nasty waste streams being dispatched in the rivers overnight or so. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I think that, uh, th th and then uh, there is this aspect uh, uh, given by resources, but that we already touched upon that uh, it's not straightforward to directly switch to uh, from fossils to renewables and, and do everything from it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work, at least now. Do you have a specific example or a case study in mind where you say, hey, there was was a big impact in terms of being better in sustainability or reducing resources. And you, you probably have been connected to it or in touch with it where you say this was a great project. I learned something on it. Yeah, I think that, uh, I, I'm not fully sure if uh, the example I will give you is, uh, is a chemical industry or energetics because it's sort of both, um, it might be, uh, actually, uh, um, uh, it, it's more energetics, combusting natural gas, but, uh, with a secondary turbine to, uh, to, with efficiency of 70%, mm -hmm. that was something that I think, uh, for example, Germany, uh, wanted to deploy, uh, to, to a broad extent before the energetic crisis came into place mm -hmm. that I think very, a huge step up, uh, in, in, in terms of, uh, efficiency of uh, how to use raw materials and so otherwise the chemical industry is more like consumer and now uh, it will be always net consumer of energy that's yeah. that's true okay thank you for that example rudolf unfortunately we are already at the end of this episode and in the end of the episode i would like to have an outlook into the future so if you think about the chemical industry probably you make it concrete to what you are working on right now to your pilot blend and you envision the future 10 years from now, how will that look like? Yeah, that's very difficult because <laughs> you already mentioned 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, uh, I, I can see this optimization uh, and uh, looking uh, after alternative resources. I, I said that it doesn't work now, but, uh, the, well, of course, the opinions or estimations of reserves, uh, the, 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 they vary a little bit, uh, but, uh, what we can certainly say that, uh, those fossils are, uh, or fossils reserves are not unlimited. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and that's, uh, that's, I think quite clear, but, uh, last resources I checked spoke about 50 to 100 years at current consumption rates. Yeah. I've also heard somebody talking about centuries ahead of us. Yeah. So. Yeah, uh, in any case, I think that, uh, this planet doesn't seem, or, or, yeah, uh, sustainable uh, or it, it's unrealistic to find chemical alternatives to the existing ones mm -hmm. and getting by with them at the current demand. So I always say in, in terms of future of chemical industry and energetics in, uh, and sustainability that, uh, finding alternative source of energy 
uh, for uh, for fossil fuels is not instrumental uh, for maintaining the climate, for example, but it's also uh, important in terms of saving those raw materials and having them cheap and available for chemicals uh, we need for whatever purpose. So as I understand you, crude oil and gas will still be needed 10 years from now as a resource. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I learned a lot, Rudolf. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks for invitation. It was a pleasure. Bye. Bye-bye.